Well, you've made it through another work week, maybe another week of studying in classes, or maybe you've been stuck at home because of this weather. Regardless, you're here at Grace, and our hope is that you're strengthened and uplifted this weekend. We've got Caleb and Keisha. They're going to be leading us in worship, and Wes has a powerful message about standing firm and rooted in Jesus. Go ahead and feel free to use the live stream chat to leave a comment, interact with other people, a part of our Grace digital community. And if you haven't already, follow Grace Church SDL on Facebook and Instagram for more encouragement throughout your week. All right, settle in, turn up the volume. Here we go. Good to see all of you here this morning. Welcome to those joining online as well. We're going to celebrate the love of Jesus today. We're going to worship our King together. Let's sing this out. Come all you weary. Come all you weary. Come all you thirsty. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water. Come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find His mercy. Come to the table, He will satisfy. Taste of His goodness, find what you're looking for.
bring your addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting God so loved the world thank you Lord come on let's get those hands clapping We thank you for the gospel. We thank you 
for calling us out of darkness into the light. We worship you this morning, Jesus. Wandering into the night and wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This bag of bones. I try with all my might. But I just can't win the fight I'm slowly drifting A vagabond But just when I ran out of road I met a man I didn't know And he told me
Lord, we bless your name. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the freedom from sin that you've won for us. Well, good morning, Grace Church, and those of you joining us online, before you grab a seat, go ahead and turn to somebody next to you and give them a, a friendly air high five or a hug, perhaps. Awesome, well, it's so good to be here with you this morning. If you're a visitor or you have any questions or you wanna get connected, there's a connect card in the seat back in front of you. you. You can go ahead and grab that and fill it out and drop it off in the offering receptacles as you head out today. If you need prayer, you can put your phone number on that connect card and someone from our prayer team would love to connect with you in the coming days and pray with you and pray over you. If you're watching online and you wanna get connected, you can text the word connect to the number on the screen and we would love to uh, reach out to you and help you get plugged in. Just as a reminder, we're gonna be doing our tithes and offerings at the end of service today. You can find ways to give on the screen. If you wanna give in person, you can take your tithes or offerings and drop it off at the receptacles under each exit sign as you leave. Well, we check, your, uh, check the e-news, check your bulletin, check our website for updated info on any small groups happening on campus, in person and off campus via Zoom. We are a huge church and we know that we need to get connected. Our small groups are the best way to engage with other like-minded believers in fellowship and godly relationships and Bible study. We are, we, we are so excited about our small groups. It's the best way to just do life together with other Christians. If you are not plugged in yet, I wanna encourage you to do that. We've also got our connect books at every info table as you head out today. And that's got all of our detailed information for every class that we have going on. Uh, well, we are in another uh, session of our Discover Grace classes. They are happening at 11 a.m. Um, on Sundays in February. In March, we're transitioning them to Wednesday nights. And there's four classes, and this is the way that you become an active member at Grace. These four classes do not need to be taken in any specific order, so you can take them as you please. Uh, but these classes are also a really good way for you to find out who we are as a church, what our biblical beliefs are, who God says that you are, and how you can engage in kingdom service. So I really wanna encourage you to check those out. Well, lastly, I'm speaking to all the, the Grace student parents. We have got a parent meeting next Sunday at uh, 1, 12.30 p.m. in room B208. We've had a lot of changes in our student ministry over the past two months, and our team would love to engage with you and meet you face to face and answer any questions you may have. So we would love for you to come out and check that out. Well, we've got a few ministries we wanted to highlight. Um, our, this church is just built up of ministry and, and serving the community around us. So let's go ahead and check out this video. Thank you, Grace Church, so much for your participation with Love the Lou, partnering with this great inner city ministry. Leadership has decided that we are not gonna just be a church, but we're gonna live the church. The church is gonna leave the building, and we did. So thank you so much. But moreover than the generosity was the heart of those, the brothers and sisters that would go down and spend weekend after weekend bringing this vision the vision of this house and restoring this home for, the, uh, for a family that was in need in this area. So thank you so much for your generosity and for your, for your help. And, and I just love to see the heart of our brothers and sisters. It just blessed me so much to see the, the volunteers down there, males and females, helping out to make a difference in these lives. So thank you, Grace. All right, hey, I wanted to highlight an amazing ministry we had this past Christmas called Give Joy. With you partnering with the, the work that God wanted to do in St. Louis, we were able to give joy to over 100 children in the forms of gifts and clothing in our community. It was an amazing outreach opportunity that we had, and we took hold of it. Well, we've got even a bigger vision for next year, and we're gonna need your help. We're gonna need you to partner with us in serving as well as your generosity to reach the goal that we have to, to reach even more children in our community. Hey, Grace Church, I am so excited to be here to brag on our fearless, faithful, fuel-packed ministry team. They are cranking out 1,500 packs a month and then turning around and serving the 200 families that come to our food bank every other week. And I wanna thank you, Grace Church, for your faithful giving. This could not be possible without you. God is right in the center of this whole thing. Uh, we're just so excited to be able to serve our community like this. And this is all possible because of you, and we are just getting started. Woo! 
Amen, amen. So thank you again for your generosity. Thank you for your time in serving us. Well, let's go ahead and pray over Wes as he uh, gives the message this morning. God, we pray that you would open our eyes, open our ears, soften our hearts to what, you're, what you wanna speak through Wes today. Lord, help him speak with clarity and discernment, Lord. Bring conviction, bring encouragement and grace upon our lives. In Jesus' name. He knows about your suffering. He knows the blasphemy of those opposing you. Don't be afraid. Stand fast and keep a strong hold on the teachings of Jesus. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you this morning. Glad that you're here. I tell you what, that was... Uh, one heck of a time of, of praising the Lord this morning. I mean, our team had a little energy on them. I, there, are, there are few things as satisfying to the soul than coming together as the body of Christ and lifting up the name of Jesus in praise, thanksgiving, adoration, singing from our hearts. I think it's some of the, the, the most needed medicine in our culture right now, in our families right now, is to come together and praise the Lord. Anybody agree with that this morning? No, it's so good. Thank you for our team that loves Jesus and makes his praise excellent. I also wanna give a shout out to our team too, just putting the, the, even that little bumper that we just saw, that little video there, of just helping and give us visual to the very things we're gonna be talking about this morning in, in the light of the storm of, of things that are pushing up against the name of the Lord and against the scripture and the call of God upon us as the church to stand firm, to hold fast and to cling to the teachings of Jesus. Father, this morning we ask that you help us. I pray that you bring conviction to our hearts, a stirring of faith to be bold and Lord, a wisdom on how to live in this age that we find ourselves alive in, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our places of work, give us boldness to be believers and wisdom to be believers. In Jesus' name, amen. Second Thessalonians chapter two, a lot of these verses, most of them are in your bulletin, in your notes, if you'd like to see those and reference those. I always like to mark up my Bible a lot and put references in there, little notes. 2 Thessalonians 2, this is where we get this passage from the title today. It says, stand firm, or some of your versions may say, hold fast and keep a strong grip or a, a firm grip or cling to the teachings that we've passed on to you. Now, ultimately, he's referring to the teachings of Jesus. And he says, now, as you do that, may our God and Father who has loved us bring comfort to your heart and establish you in every good word and work. You can see in this passage, there's our part and then there's God's part. We do our part, he says, in troubling times and trying times, stand fast, hold to the teachings of Jesus, and then he'll do, he'll do his part. He'll bring a comfort upon our hearts because sometimes standing is costly to our reputation, it's costly to relationships, it's costly to what's popular or unpopular. There's a cost, but he's saying, but don't be afraid, because in the midst of the cost, God will bring a comfort and a peace that touches the heart and touches the mind, and he will establish you. I see that as a, an anointing, an authority that comes from the Lord, that he will establish every word that we say to have more oomph on our words of life and our words of meaning to those that we're in dialogue with and processing with. I will establish every good word and work in your life. Jesus says it like this in another passage in Luke 21. 
Now, Luke 21, the whole chapter is Jesus revealing troubling times, both then, you know, a couple thousand years ago when he's talking to the people that he was talking to right there in Jerusalem, he's saying, it's gonna get hard. They were already tasting that a little bit. You know, the name of Jesus was becoming more hostile. I mean, he had, he had fans and followers for sure, but he had a lot of haters. And that was increasing. The death threats upon him was increasing. What he was saying was becoming, to, was getting more and more unpopular. Now, there were some things they said that, oh, I like that. that that's good. I mean, we all like a little Jesus sprinkled in on it. But when we consider everything he had to say, ugh. Sometimes it hurts, sometimes it stings, because our flesh doesn't like it. A lot of the world's wisdom doesn't like it at all. So in Luke 21, they're very aware of this growing threat against the name of the Lord. And he says, by standing firm, Luke 21, 9, by standing firm. And what he meant was what Paul was saying in 2 Thessalonians 2, by holding fast to the things that I'm teaching you, on who I am saying God is, who I am saying you are, the boundaries in life that he is establishing, the meaning of life. He says, by standing firm, now look at this, you will win your souls. Now some versions in your Bible may say you will possess your souls. Now the soul of a person is made up of, of, our, of our mind, will, and emotions. It's made up of the capacity of all of our inner thought life. It's made up of the emotions that drive us and the emotions that are sometimes triggered and can you know, give, kind of be out of whack every once in a while when we're hit with something. It's made up of our desires. And he's saying if you will do your part and stand firm on the teachings of Jesus, you will actually gain authority or you will win your souls, meaning that your souls will be able to stay steady even when there's pressure. Your mind won't go berserk. Your, your emotions won't freak out. Your desires won't grow in an ungodly way. He says, by standing firm, you will possess your souls. I think more than ever, now is the time for us as the church to understand what it means to stand firm and to cling to the teachings of Jesus, to know the teachings of Jesus. Because I'm gonna lay out in a minute why I believe these teachings are being threatened in a very serious way. I mean, they always have been. It just seems like there's all of a sudden been a bump in the increased intensity towards the scriptures in a hostile way. Psalm 51 verse 10 is how I am establishing my own heart and my prayer for my family, my wife, my four kids. In the midst of the culture in which we find ourselves in with divisiveness and just intensity and hatred and any reason at all to be offended, any reason at all to demonize somebody that thinks or looks different than us. Psalm 51:10. God, create in me a clean heart. It's a good prayer right now to adopt on a pretty continual basis because the, 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 you know, the, the flames of, of stoking disunity and stoking hostility toward each other in our, in our nation across the world is just, it's constant. Lord, create in me a clean heart. Some versions say a loyal heart. I, I, I like that too. It means the same thing. Create in me a loyal heart to you, Lord. Create in me a clean heart that I may see you rightly, see myself rightly, and, this is important, see other people rightly. To see other people the way you see people. Not the way I'm being pressured to see people. To see people through your eyes. Then he goes on and he says, oh God, this is hard. This is like the way we process this next phrase of Psalm 51. God, this is really hard to stay steady with a pure and clean heart with all of the arrows coming at me. Renew in me a steadfast spirit. Give me perseverance. Give me strength to not quit. Give me strength to not grow in resentment or grow in judgment or grow in bitterness, grow in offense. Give me strength to stay steady. Now the only way we get a steadfast spirit is when there is the presence of opposition. It's the very definition of perseverance is when we're staying steady to push when there is opposition. And the opposition that we're speaking of today is the opposition against the plain teachings of scripture. 
defining various things of life. Create in me a pure heart, O God, a clean heart, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Right now, Jesus says the finest hour of the church is in the midst of pressure, in the midst of hostility, because it is when we can be the salt and light that we are meant to be. In Matthew 5, he says, you are the salt of the earth. Not, you know, us up here on the stage or you over there leading the class, but the body of Christ, believers in our homes, in our neighborhoods, our places of work, our schools, we are meant to be the salt of the earth. Now, part of what he means by the salt of the earth is preserving that which is good and what God calls good, because that's getting confused right now in our culture of what is good and what is evil, because our culture has a very strong definition too. But Bible, the Bible, the scriptures, Jesus himself defines that which is good and wholesome, godly, pure, holy. When we are to be the salt of the earth, believers are to be an agent that is fighting to preserve that which is good in our society. He says, you are the light of the world. The light of the world means that we give meaning for life. That as we partner with God in the scriptures that we are not silent about giving what the Bible says the meaning of life is, the purpose of life, the boundaries of life, that he establishes the narrative or the story of what life is. That's what it means for the church to be the light of the world is that as we partner with Jesus, we help the world, a lost and broken world that is disconnected from their creator, understand the meaning of life and how we are to pursue happiness, how we are to pursue wholeness, and what success even is. He says, you're like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. So blessed by that ministry highlight video. You know, we are living in a day where we as the church, we, we, we are a church of words that gives meaning, but we are a church of action. We have to be a church where Jesus says, here's the way that you're gonna show you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world by your good deeds. Being eager to do good all the time. And the way that plays out is us as families, how can we do good right there in our neighborhoods? How can we show salt and light and preserving that which is good and, and speaking life when we see life and, and speaking of, of, of good when we see good? How can we be an agent that displays the goodness of God? He says, let your good deeds shine forth like a city on a hill so that everyone can see who we really are the way that we really value people, the way that we really respect and honor people made in the image of God, even those that may believe and think very different than us. Let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone ultimately will praise your Father in heaven. In other words, they're given a witness of what our Father in heaven truly is like, that God is a God who values people and loves people. The church in Thessalonica, when Paul wrote this to them, 2 Thessalonians 2, when he said, hey, you gotta stand firm because there's a cost, hold to the teachings of Jesus, you gotta understand, that wasn't you know, an easy saying. That wasn't an easy exhortation because the church in Thessalonica was under severe pressure. Some of them, it cost them their jobs to cling to the teachings of Jesus. Some of them, it cost them their life. They had family members under the pressures of doing certain things that were contrary to the teachings of Scripture and the words of Jesus, and it cost them, ultimately. And so Paul's words to them to stand firm, it was, it was hard, because there was a cost to it. Yet Paul would say to them, it'll be worth it, because you will experience a comfort on your heart. You will experience the grace of God in your, on your mind and on your heart 
that presence of the Lord, that even when there's a cost of our reputation, even when there's a cost to our money, even when there's a cost of things that are helpful, <laughs> he says it'll be worth it because the presence of God upon your heart. You know, there's a church similar to Thessalonica in Revelation 2, it's the church in Smyrna. I wanna encourage you to just, those, those Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus writes seven specific letters to churches that are under severe pressure. And we're going, I mean, those, church, those letters have always been relevant through history, but there is a, it, it just seems like a little bit more relevancy, even in the time that we are in right now in America. The exhortations and the rebukes that Jesus brings in these letters are, are very applicable and relevant right now. Look at what he says to the church in Smyrna. This is right from Jesus, Revelation 2, 9 and 10. He says, I know about your suffering and your poverty. Now pause for a second. The reason that they're suffering and the reason that they're in poverty was because of standing on the teachings of Jesus. It wasn't just because they happened to live in a poor area. They were suffering because of their commitment to the Lord and being affiliated with the name of Jesus. It was costly. When you're affiliated with him and affiliated with all that he said, again, affiliated with some of what he said is celebrated, but if we affiliate with all of what he said, it's costly. In that time, even for union workers, good old blue collar union workers, you had to participate in, in certain government you know, kind of endorsed, well, let's just say things, celebrations, the way to kind of get your union card punched. But those celebrations and those feasts that they had to be a part of were incredibly ungodly, incredibly anti-Bible and celebrating unbiblical ideas. So many of them were having their ability to work taken away because of their affiliation with Jesus. And so the Lord comes to them in Revelation 2, they're suffering, they're in poverty. I mean, I can imagine, Lord, do you see the cost that this is costing me? I need some help, I need a breakthrough, change some laws, if you will. And the Lord comes to them, and here's comfort number one, God sees them. That, that's comfort number one right there, is that you don't, they're not going unseen. God sees their suffering. I believe that's gonna be more and more relevant to us in the days of head. Because it, it, I think it's gonna be more costly in the days of head for Americans, and not just America, across the globe, to be affiliated with all that Jesus said. And he says, I see you. I want you to know that your, your suffering isn't going unseen. He goes on and he says, I want you to know my opinion of you, that even though you're impoverished, you're profoundly rich. He says, you might be impoverished in the natural, but from an eternal perspective, what really matters in our souls prospering and growing, our spirits growing strong, the things that will matter forever compared to just the little 60, 70 years we have now. He says, you're profoundly wealthy. Don't let anyone fool you on that one. You may be impoverished now, but you're rich. He says, I see the blasphemy of those opposing you. I see it. He says, but don't be afraid what you are about to suffer. Unfortunately for them, you know, the suffering wasn't gonna be relieved just yet. But good old Pastor Jesus says, stay steady. Cling to my teachings. I will give you the crown of life. It will be worth it. There will be no regret in your heart, I promise you is what the Lord was saying. You know, there's a growing threat right now in the teachings of scripture in America. I mean, Ron has been sounding the alarm over and over and over for the last several months, and I know for many of us it's been unnerving. It's been like, yeah, I don't like it, stop. But there is something that he is seeing that I believe we need to pay attention to. And it's ultimately a growing threat against at the end of the day, the pure teachings of what Jesus said. And I don't believe we're on the level of Thessalonica or where, where they were at in Smyrna. Who knows, we may have you know, some time to go until it's at that level. There's many other Western countries that are 
quite a bit ahead of us that still aren't at the level of Thessalonica and Smyrna as far as hostility. But I tell you what, we're clearly on that path. There is a growing resentment towards the teachings of Jesus, a growing hostility. It will become more and more unpopular to be connected and affiliated with Jesus. This growing pressure, this challenge for the church will be to cling to the truths of Jesus even when these truths are seen as unloving, hateful, and even evil. Jesus sets the narrative of life for us. This is where we have to be super clear. We call this a worldview, the way that we see the world. And what that means is the way that we see ourselves and the way that we see each other. The purpose of life. Jesus in the Bible establishes this narrative. And it's critical for us to know this narrative. Because there is an opposing narrative that's getting louder and louder and louder, but it's subtle. And it's kind of sneaky. And what I mean by sneaky is that there's some Jesus principles sprinkled through it. It sounds good at first, yet it's poisonous. And again, if you've been tracking with us over the last several months, Ron has been very clearly sounding this alarm. And sometimes I know it's unnerving, but I believe there's truths in what he's saying and helping us to see the opposition of Scripture that is here and that is increasing. Jesus sets the narrative of life for us, how we're to see the world, see ourselves, relate to each other. He also defines sin. He gives boundaries. Because again, part of our culture celebrates some of the teachings of Jesus. They love this statement over here or this statement over here. But when he begins to give clear boundaries, and when he begins to clearly define sin, all of a sudden things shift and they shift dramatically. We can't pick and choose. Jesus is either all right or he's all wrong. And as a believer, one thing that we have to settle in our hearts is that he isn't just the word of a few scriptures, he is the word from Genesis to, to Revelation. That he is truly the embodiment of the word of God. He is the expression of life. We get our narrative, our worldview from him and him alone culture with a lot of our politics are demanding a different narrative, a, a narrative, a, a worldview, a story where they define what life is, demanding how we see the world, how we see each other, how we relate to each other. There are biblical ideas sprinkled through it. The appealing for some of the taglines are actually very appealing. I mean, who could not, you know, agree and get on board with equality and love and unity? We're, we're all in. There's biblical pr principles sprinkled on it. It's like I had a good friend of mine, Billy Humphrey, he said, it's like a good steak season, and man, it looks really good until you bite into it. And then you begin to bite into it and you begin to digest it and it gets in here and you realize it's poisonous. I like this quote from Ron. Well, I don't like it. It's, it's hard, but it's true. We're being pulled into a culture of acceptance where everything is normalized and nothing is sin. And again, this is where affiliation with Jesus begins gets costly. If we say certain things, it's okay as long as we don't go here, as long as we don't get boundaries, as long as we don't define sin. And what the unfortunate thing is is that God defines sin for the purpose of happiness in life, not the robbery of happiness. God defines boundaries in life for the purpose of having a whole life that is filled with contentment and filled with joy, not to rob us from joy. Yet the narrative of our world, the secular narrative, is very opposite. It's a narrative of, of no boundaries. It's a narrative that anything goes. Yes, we want peace, we want unity. Yes, we want equality. But then there's this shift when it relates to the rest 
of what Jesus says on how to pursue those things, the boundaries in which we are to pursue those things. There's a clear resistance. How we see each other as different races and critical theory. And again, I know that this stuff was out of nowhere last year when Ron began to say these things. And I began to be like, what? Because so much of critical theory sounds good. And I've too read several books where I would read these approaches of creating unity within the races in our, in our nation. And I'm like, yes. But then the approach on how to get there is basically racism. No. There's all of a sudden a halt. It is a time for us to clearly see this narrative as what it is. It is a worldview that is being pressed upon us and it is contradicting the worldview of Jesus. What sexuality is and that anything goes with gender identity, I believe this one is the most alarming to me. Right now there is a narrative of defining sexuality of defining what is accepted and what is not accepted. And if you dare question the narrative or push back against the narrative, you're demonized. And again, Jesus put boundaries in place on gender. Jesus put boundaries in place on the expression of sexuality. The Bible was crystal clear of defining marriage. And I know these things sting because our culture is pushing for an acceptance and that we do not put boundaries on sexuality. We do not put boundaries on gender. Beloved, now is the time more than ever to stand firm on the narrative of life that Jesus gave because this is subtle and it's unrelenting and our children right now are not given the option to even question. Our children right now are not given the option in our schools to question the narrative or to push back because of the hostile culture of demonizing anyone that presses up against that narrative. That's, again, when Jesus would say, stand firm. Now, don't be arrogant, don't be rude, but stand firm. We're being pressured on what it means to be a man or what it doesn't mean to be a man. We're being pressured on what it means to be a woman or what it doesn't mean to be a woman with a, a radical movement on both sides, completely confusing the lines of what God had in his mind when he created a woman or when he created a man. Beautiful things that are right and godly and true with clear definitions and boundaries, yet they're being opposed. Many years ago, we saw when marriage was redefined in our nation. And again, this is a, a clear assault against the teachings of scripture. And I get the pull, I get the pressure of, but we want equality, we wanna treat each other with fairness, yes. But we can't redefine the narrative. God has the authority and the wisdom to define the narrative of what it means to be human what it means to build humanity, what it means to build relationships, what it means to build families. And we cannot be afraid to stand and preserve that which is good and how he has defined it. Because it's proven to work. It's proven to be good and godly. Yet for us to stand against that narrative will be costly. God, give us boldness and give us wisdom. That's my prayer. God, give us boldness and give us wisdom to navigate these rocky waters because we believe that Jesus sets the narrative and we're not gonna be conditioned and pushed to believe a different narrative about sexuality and relationships, and gender, how we relate to each other from different races and different social classes, different backgrounds. Let me pray for a second. Father, we ask you right now for boldness and wisdom. Boldness to not be afraid to stand on the truth of what you define, but wisdom to do it in such a way 
Lord, that we don't do it in a careless way. We don't do it in a way that's reckless. We stand. God, give us boldness and wisdom in Jesus' name. I believe this threat against this this story of Jesus about these various things that we're facing, I believe this threat will increase. It seems that in 2020 there was just a shift and we had so many things in 2020 that blew up. But it seems that there's a, a greater intensity from secular worldview and even within our politics to just a little bit more pressure forcing this narrative down our throats, and of course, we've seen the, the majority of media forces this narrative, the, the majority of our sports world. I watch the NBA or Major League Baseball or the NFL and all of these you know, awesome athletes that I love and I love to watch them and I'm inspired by their work ethic. Yet many of them are also celebrating much of this narrative. And again, it's got Jesus sprinkled in it, or at least maybe not the name of Jesus, but it's got biblical ideas of unity and equality and love. Those are great ideas. But again, we have to discern that the application is profoundly unbiblical and dangerous and will actually turn. It'll turn kids against parents. It'll turn us against the Bible. We will find ourselves in opposition to Jesus himself. Jesus says in Luke 21, he says, therefore settle this in your hearts. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. Settle that. There needs to really be a settling in the church. There needs to be a settling that to be affiliated with the truths of Jesus will cause a disdain towards us. He said it himself, this has happened throughout church history. There's been pockets where it's got a little bit quieter. And then there's been times when it has intensified. And if we're paying attention right now, again, because of this secular narrative on these various things are, are gaining pressure, they're gaining momentum, this is not good for those that will affiliate with the teachings of Jesus. He says, settle it in your hearts. You will be hated for my name's sake. But don't worry, don't be afraid. Not a hair of your head shall be lost. In other words, God will preserve us. There will be a peace and a a grace that touches our heart. He goes on in verse 34 and 35. He says, watch out during those times. Watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled or weighed down because of the pressure and because of how hard it is to stand firm and to not be conditioned, to not be swayed. The cost that it is sometimes to be affiliated with the teachings of Jesus on various boundaries and truths. He says, watch out. Don't let your hearts be dulled down. Don't check out with carousing or drunkenness. Stay alert. Make sure your heart is connected with the Lord in a vibrant way. He says, don't let that day catch you unaware like a trap. For that day will come upon you, or will will come upon everyone living on the earth. There is no exception. He says, this is a, a, not just an American issue, this is a global issue, meaning the hostility towards the teachings of Jesus, because it's in broken humanity. It's in secular humanity that casts off the restraint of God. That's a global crisis. And Jesus says, watch out for that day, because it'll be like a trap. Now, a trap is intended to catch its prey and then to hold its prey. It's not easy to get loosed of a trap when you're in a trap. And I I want us to understand this, that the primary trap that Jesus speaks of is deception. It's buying in to a false narrative. The primary trap that he speaks of is believing of false prophets or or false narratives, false stories. And I'm telling us, it's about... The the narrative of life, of the boundaries and God defining various things with sexuality and, and marriage and race and how we treat each other, how we love and, and honor each other. There he says there is a trap that's gonna sweep across every nation of the earth. Beware of it, be on guard, don't be deceived. 
And don't be offended of the things that happens when the pressure goes up. Because when there's pressure, I mean, uh, one thing I like about pressure is that it reveals the strength within us. That's the good part of pressure. The bad part of pressure is that it reveals the not so good in us. It reveals the ugliness and the weaknesses within us. And sometimes that causes us to worry, that causes us to, to be offended and then grow in greater offense when our flesh is touched in a negative way, when we feel the pressure of not wanting our reputation to be smeared or trying to hold on to finances here or job opportunity here. But God, I, it's costed me this, it's costed me that. Jesus says, settle it in your hearts now so that we're not taken in the trap that's gonna take many across the nations. How do we do this? How do we practically stand firm? What does it mean? Let's break it down for us. Because Paul said back in 2 Thessalonians 2, stand firm and keep a strong grip on the teachings of Jesus. Number one, practical, is discern the fruit of what we're hearing and watching. Is the narrative that I'm drinking from about sexuality contradicting the teachings of Jesus about sexuality? Is the narrative that I'm watching and listening to about growing in relationship with each other or racial equality, of growing and loving and honoring each other, preferring each other in love? Is the, what I'm listening to and watching on how to do that, is it contradicting the teachings of Scripture? Right now, there is such a, a, a conditioning, and again, it's subtle, but it's consistent I see this in our, our, our kids' education. You know, we've homeschooled our, our whole lives, and then this year when everything was virtual with our older two, we said, hey, let's, let's jump in, and you're gonna be home anyway, and you're virtual, let's see how you guys are kinda doing, you know, as a, a, six, a, se a seventh and a sixth grader. And our, our, our kids jumped into school, and, and it mostly great, but I've also noticed, just as I'm in dialogue with what they're learning and hearing, those subtle little things about, again, the boundaries in life what it means to be a, a boy or what it means to be a girl or sexuality or even marriage and various things that it's defining, how we are to approach racial equality, how we are approach each other in relationship and honor and preference. Just little subtle things. This is the time now more than ever to be aware, discern the fruit of what we're listening to and watching. And know that, I mean, there's just bias everywhere because there's an agenda. Matthew 7, beware of false prophets is the way Jesus said it. Don't limit false prophets to an Old Testament prophet that's prophesying something even around Scripture. One way to interpret false prophets is simply false narratives, false worldviews that are contradicting the worldview that Jesus lays out. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. They come in a way that seems very right, very gentle, very kind, very good. And he says, yet inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. You will know them by the fruit that they produce. Now again, what Jesus is speaking of, the fruit that it produces in relationship to the word of God? Does it bear the fruit that draws us closer to the word of God, celebrating the boundaries of the word of God, celebrating the defini definition of life according to the word of God? He says, beware of false prophets in that day. Galatians 5 lays out for us the stirrings of the flesh, what sin is. He defines sin. He says, the desires of sin, is, of, of the sinful nature is super clear. Sexual immorality. I mean, the Bible defines morality sexually very clearly between a man and a woman under the covenant of marriage. Yet we are seeing a narrative that is forced upon us that broadens that definition. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy. I mean, it's quite the list. 
And what I have seen is that some of the narrative that is out there on even approaching unity and, and equality and love, things that sound good and I wanna celebrate, yet as I begin to taste and drink of that narrative, it's not creating peace and unity and love. It is maybe according to the secular narrative, but according to Jesus, it's actually creating division. It's creating dissension. We have to be aware and discern the fruit on what we are hearing and what our children are hearing. Good old honest godly conversations about the boundaries and the definition of life that Jesus lays out. Number two, as we commit to walk in the spirit. This is how we cling to the teachings of Jesus. We commit to honor God in our speech, attitude, and actions. Particularly right now with people that, are, that disagree with maybe our values or our narrative, that are hostile towards our narrative. We don't respond with hostility. We don't respond with slander. We respond by honoring all people. This is one of the, you know, the things that those that may lean more conservative that I'm very, it's got, I'm, I'm alarmed by this. Because when we begin to call out some of these things and expose some of these things in our, narr- in our culture that are very liberal, or maybe not liberal, but very unbiblical as it relates to sexuality, etc. I, I, I don't want us to see some conservatives, and this is where I'm more lean, I don't want to see self-righteousness stirred up in me. To where I kind of like, yeah, take that. No, that's not the way we cling to Jesus and stand firm. We cling to Jesus and stand firm here by by Galatians 5 where we put on the, the Holy Spirit with love and joy and peace and kindness, patience, goodness, self control. That is the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit that we want to see in our words, that we want to see in our Facebook posts, that we want to see in our interactions with people, particularly those that are differing with us in values and definitions of life. Number three is we commit to work through offense. This is how we stand fast and cling to Jesus. We commit to work through our offenses. We have seen so many opportunities right now to be stirred up, to be offended, to be fearful. And we commit to not give over to that fear or give over to that offense. As Christians, as believers, we are committed to work through our offense by having honest dialogue with each other, conversing around the table. It says in in Colossians 3, we do this by clothing ourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you quickly. The way that we work out our offense really is number one, we take our offense to Jesus. I mean, I love talking with others about my offense and things that are touching my heart in a negative way. That's that's very healthy. But it's not to be in place of talking to Jesus directly about how that person offended me or slandered me. We have to take our offenses right now and directly talk to Jesus and we talk with each other. We process with each other in a godly way, encouraging each other to be quick to forgive. In a godly way, encouraging each other to work through our offenses. It's the time more than ever to join us in our prayer meetings because when we are coming together in the place of prayer, And when we come together to to worship and to praise his name, it's amazing when God's spirit touches our heart how much easier it is to work through offense. When I have the presence of God on my heart and mind, I can forgive people so much easier. I mean, they can spread rumors about me, take things what I said out of context and, you know, label me as this or label me as that. It's what the culture's really good at right now. And I'm stung and I want to defend myself and I want to push back. But when I come to a prayer meeting and I get the presence of God in my heart, I'm able to do what Jesus asked me to do. Bless them. Pray for them. Forgive them. I, just, I, I, I can actually think God blessing them. 
That is so contrary to the flesh. And it's so contrary to the secular narrative. Because the secular narrative is no. If somebody disagrees with this narrative, demonize them. Shame them publicly. Do whatever we can do to make sure they don't ever show their face again. Incredibly contradictory to the ways of Scripture. And as the church, we are not to be of that spirit. We are to bless Get in a prayer meeting and let the presence of God help us to do that very thing. Uh, I want to encourage parents right now. The fourth Wednesday of the month, look at your neighbor and say, fourth Wednesday. I only heard like four people. Try it again. Everybody look at, just look around, even somebody way over there, say, fourth Wednesday. On the fourth Wednesday of every month, that's coming up here in a few days. I'm asking parents to use that Wednesday every month to fast and pray for our kids. We're also turning that prayer meeting, because one of our weekly prayer meetings is at Wednesday night at seven. Our students are actually leading that prayer meeting. They'll be leading the worship, they'll be leading the prayers. And we wanna create that student takeover prayer meeting as a day of fasting and prayer for our children to have boldness to stand strong in this hour and to cling to the teachings of Jesus. Parents, join me in this. Use that Wednesday to fast and pray in whatever way you can for our kids, and then join us in prayer. And then the, the, the next thing that we can do as well on how to work out our offenses is get in a small group. Small groups are intended for us to be able to break down the scriptures together, process the pressures that we're feeling, how, what is a biblical response right now to these pressures? How, what are the teachings of, of Jesus that we're to cling to? How do we do it in our workplace, at school? How do we do it in our neighborhoods? How do we have conversation and engage culture, not retreat and go build a cabin on the other side of the mountains and just wait for 50 years? No, how do we engage together? Small groups are meant to help us to do this life together. Lastly, I'll say this, and number four, honor people. Let's be the best ever right now at honoring people. Every people, all people. People that believe very different, think very different, live very different. Let's be amazing at valuing people. Seeing people not through the eyes of, of a secular world, but seeing people through the eyes of God that died for them. Here's the way I always answer that question. I say, Wes, John 3, 16. God died for that person. Be careful on the, 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 the view of them that you entertain in your mind. God died for them. He loves people. We need to be excellent church at valuing and honoring people with our words. Matthew 5, 44, I referenced this earlier. He says, I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and slander you and cause your popularity to be smeared, cause job opportunities to be smeared. Pray, pray for them. Bless them. I'm gonna have the worship team come and join me. What is God's work in all of this? You know, we've been talking a lot about what we do and how we stand firm, but we can't forget that Paul says, as we stand firm, it says in 2 Thessalonians 2 that the God of all comfort will comfort us and establish us. There is an authority that comes. I love this verse in Isaiah 32. As we do our part in standing firm, he says, my people will abide in a peaceful habitation. Their homes will be homes of peace and rest. Even in the midst of hostility, I imagine the church in Thessalonica and Smyrna, I imagine the church now as we stand when it's costly. He says, I will assure you of this, the presence of God will give your home peace. Your children will be able to rest in peace. This is also part of standing firm. God responds. God gives an abundance of grace upon the heart to even be joyful in times of hardship in times when it's not so popular to be affiliated with the name of Jesus. 1 Peter 4. Go ahead and stand with me. I want to end with this one. 1 Peter 4. If you are reproached, well, let's look at this because this is an important one. I got my name all over this one. 
If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. If you are reproached for standing and clinging to the narrative that God lays out, and the narrative of secular society reproaches you for it, again, not in a careless way, not in a foolish way, but in a way that's still standing and being clear. He says, blessed are you. There is a blessing from God that comes when it's costly to be affiliated with the name of Jesus. He says, for the spirit of glory and God rests upon you. The spirit of glory speaks of the very presence of God himself. This is God's part. He says, you do your part and stand firm. I'll do my part. I will have a spirit of glory that will touch your mind, that will bring a calm to you. It'll bring a rest, a boldness, a clarity. And I, as a dad in my home, I'm, 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 I'm eager. I want that spirit over my house so that my kids that are feeling this pressure, that are feeling the pressure of that, that false narrative disagreeing and pushing up against the narrative I'm establishing in my home. But I want my kids to be able to feel my home and when they go to bed at night, at peace, joyful. Father, here we are. Here we are. Help us. Help us to not be deceived. Help us to not be lured in by a, a very clear agenda in our, our, our culture and even some of our political life that is seeking to establish a narrative contradicting your teaching. And Lord, help us to stand firm when it's costly to not be afraid, to not be overwhelmed with anxiety and fear. Lord, you said there would be a blessing that would come, comfort that would come. You said that a spirit of glory would rest upon us. I'm asking for that for every family. I'm asking for that for every person right now. Rest upon us. Help us, Lord. Let's all sing this together as a prayer. I'm laying down my life. I'm giving up control. Never looking back. I surrender all. Help us. I'm living for your glory on the earth. Lord, help us. Do something in our heart. This passion in my heart strengthens us. Stirring in my soul. To not be afraid. To see the nations bow. To not be deceived. For all the world to know, I'm living for Your glory. All we want to measure earth. everything according to Your name and Your teaching. For the sake of the world. Burn like a fire. Oh, let's make this our prayer, church. Light a flame in my soul. To be a blessing to our neighbors, co workers, for the sake of our clients, the world. our employees, like a fire our classmates. Me. To give meaning to life, to call them to the blessed life of following Jesus. Oh, help us, Holy Spirit. This passion in my heart, this stirring in my soul, see the nations bow for all the world to know. I'm living for your glory on the earth. For the sake of
cry out, burn like a fire in me. For every tongue to confess, you alone are the King. You are the hope of the earth. Burn like a fire in me. For every knee to bow down, for every heart to believe, for every voice to cry out. team if you'll come down apologize for going a few minutes over today if you're here this morning and you need prayer maybe just to help you navigate the waters maybe a, a relationship a situation at work maybe a health reason don't go through the difficulties of life alone let our prayer team pray with you maybe you're not certain on even who Jesus is you've known about the church but you've never known him personally you don't know what it means to have our sins released or, or taken out of, off of our life, to have a born again experience and to trust Jesus. Let our prayer team pray with you. If you'd like to, you can even text the word commit. And we'll engage you in a conversation and help and answer some questions or to pray with you as well. Let me pray a prayer over you as you go this morning. Father, as we go from here, would you help us? We pray for blessings over our health, protection from sickness and disease. Lord, guide us in our conversations. Let us be an honor to your name, a blessing to your name in all that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, Grace Church. Come and join us for a prayer meeting. One last thing as well. Our Saint City Young Adults, this Friday, first meeting of the year, Join us in the foundry at seven for all of our young adults coming together to worship, to dialogue about these things. How do we stand firm? Seven o'clock this Friday. God bless you. It was so awesome having you with us at Grace STL this weekend. Hey, you may have prayer requests throughout the week and we wanna be here to pray with you. So text us at 314-310-0314. We'll see you next time.